on integration function members. Begin. Good morning, everybody. Well, first of all, let me thank Mark Silverman, um, Hermann Butler, and also Klaus Hornberger, who could unfortunately not make it today, to invite me to that very interesting workshop. As you see from the title, while well, I will be speaking about something which is a little bit disconnected from what you do, um, but in a sense, well, so I'm not exposed to the things you're talking to every day, and I find it very interesting to be here. Well, I will tell you a little bit what we do. I hope you like it as well. I did a lo lot of effort in order to orient my talk a little bit more towards the topic of this workshop. And, well, it has stopped actually by changing the title. So what I'm going to tell you is something in about integrated quantum memory using many charged particles. Because what we have here is a crystal, a little nihilate crystal, which has a lot of Herb, uh, oh, sorry, thulium ions integrated. So these are the charged particles, and the sheer mass and the sheer number of these particles makes them also very heavy. So that addresses one part of the topic of the workshop. And if I have enough time at the end, I will also tell you how you can use these charged particles in order not to do interference, but to mediate interference of light. Uh, so altogether, well, this is certainly an experiment which targets quantum information. I will keep that aspect very brief. It has been done at the University of Calgary in my group, together with my students Erhan Zagram Jurek, Neil Sinkler, postdoc Cecilia Ramela, who is in Montreal right now, and in collaboration with a group of Wolfgang Zola at the University of Paderborn, who actually grew this sample for us. So here's the outline of the talk. I will very, very briefly introduce why some people are so heavily researching quantum memory, possibility to store and recall quantum states encoded into photons map them in and out of, uh, out of atoms, show you a little bit what properties we are actually after and what has been shown, uh, shown so far. And we'll then tell you something about a traditional approach to what one could consider or has been considered storage of light, which is based on a photon echo type storage. And I will in particular tell you why this does actually not work to store quantum states of light. And I'll show you then how you can modify these original ideas to protocols which are now referred to as controlled, reversible, inhomogeneous broadening of an isolated absorption line or to atomic frequency comms and tell you that this actually allows you to store and recall quantum states of light with unity efficiency and fidelity. And then I will go towards the experimental demonstration where I show you storage of light pulses in the thulium lithium niobate dope <coughs> waveguide. I will show you storage of 500 picosecond short pulses. I will show you storage of 100 optical modes simultaneously. And if I have time, I will also tell you something about atom-mediated interference, which is also of large importance in the field of quantum information. And I come to a conclusion after that. So quantum memory, here a black box, or rather a blue box, but you can think of it simply as a synchronization device, like the memory, like your hard disk in your computer. Sometimes you have information coming in, and you have to keep it until this information is needed. In this case, the information is well, a quantum state encoded into light. We want to store it here until we need it. Need it may mean we have to wait from some, for some classical information, for some, some optical pulse, for some electronic pulses to arrive to tell us what we should do with that. Need it may also mean we have to wait until we get another photon with another quantum state that then we have to process jointly. You see one of the most important application for quantum memory, which is a quantum repeater. And I do not want to go a lot into detail here. The goal of a quantum repeater is to distribute entanglement between two particles over very large distances. So it turns out, if you have a source that generates entangled photons directly, well, you can send these two photons into opposite directions over a certain distance, but this distance is limited. If you want to go further, then you have to split the overall link into several shorter links, let's say from here to here and from here to here, then you use sources, you put sources of entangled particles in the middle of each link. Let's look at this source here. It sends one photon to the left, one photon to the right. We stick a quantum memory in here and in here, which then stores the entanglement that I have distributed over this distance here. We may do it in parallel and uh, then do a measurement here that allows us to purify the entanglement here and here, and then we store it once again between this and this part. And now we have entanglement sitting here, and it simply has to wait, it has to last until we have achieved the same thing on the neighboring segment of the overall link. So we see the synchronization here. Once that has happened as well, then we can release the photons from these two memories, make a joint measurement, which leads to the fact that we swapped entanglement to the most outer memories, in which case we have managed to entangle all memories which are very far apart. And by concatenating these links, we can at least in principle, theorists tell us, extend entanglement distribution to arbitrary long distances. 
That's theory. Experiment is a little bit more difficult. I don't believe about any distance, but we can certainly do quite well. The properties we are after, well, we would like to have a large efficiency, meaning if we have a single photon arriving, we would like to recall it with probability of one, if possible. We also want a large fidelity, which describes how close is the quantum state encoded into the recalled photon with respect to the one we originally want to send in. So we also want that to be perfect, meaning fidelity equals one. We want to store many photons at the same time, or otherwise phrased, we want to store many optical modes at the same time, not just one after the other, like your hard disk, while you want terabyte and not just one bit storage. We want to be able to store <laughs> quantum information or quantum states encoded into short carriers of light. The shorter they are, the more we can stick in one second, so the larger will, our, will be our bit rate at the end. So just as a nice number, I said, well, we want something which is of the order or shorter than a nanosecond. That got, gets close to what telecommunication actually does. Storage time, it turns out that what we need is related to the round trip time between the most outer memories that we want to entangle. So something of the order of seconds would certainly do already very, very well. And at the end, while well, the complexity of the overall setup should be simple. Obviously. Where are we now? If you look at those properties here, you realize that we're actually not far away from the dream properties. Efficiencies, 70% recently demonstrated in a group in Australia. Fidelity, 97%, that is post-selected, that's uh, conditioned on the fact that we actually retrieve a photon. Well, very close to one, demonstrated in Geneva. Multi-mode capacity, so far published, 64 modes, also in Geneva. Pulse duration, a group in Oxford, around one nanosecond. Storage time, about two seconds. And the complexity, well, okay, let's not speak too much about that. So this looks very good. However, I, I point out that all these different achievements have been achieved or demonstrated with different approaches to storage, based on electromagnetic field transparency, based on the photon echo type approach that I will talk more about later, labels and other approaches. And they've all been demonstrated in different materials. This may be atomic vapor, that may be cold, cooled atomic vapor, that may be rare earth ions in solid state crystals. And so there is still certainly a lot of work to be done in order well, to push these things a little bit further, but also in order to combine all these things. But altogether, this is all done over the last three or four years. The sheer amount of progress there is, I think, very, very impressive. So how could you, in principle, store light? And what I'm going to tell you from now on is all related to storage of light in what we call inhomogeneously broadened materials. So these are atomic devices, or well, solid stoked with ions, or vapors, which consists of many, many, many absorbers. So we have a large ensemble of absorbers, and we assume that all these absorbers have individually a very small line width. But if I look at the absorption altogether, well, we see that we have very broad absorption. So you can think of atomic vapor, where the width here is just given by the homogeneous language of individual ions or atoms, but altogether we have Doppler shift, so depending on the projection of the velocity on the line of sight, we have blue or red shifted um, resonance frequencies. So now let's suppose we have these ions, we consider, or atoms, we consider it's a two-level system, everything in the beginning is in the ground state, we send in a pi over two pulse, which makes a rotation of the block vector, which initial points down around an axis, let's say V, and flips it up, up along the U axis. Now we have phase evolution, which depends on the frequency of each individual absorber. So since we have this inhomogeneous broadening, while well, different absorbers will, well, their phase will advance at different rates. So we see that in a frame that rotates with the carrier frequency of light, we see that some dipole moments will actually deface clockwise and others counterclockwise with respect to those that correspond to the carrier frequency of light. So what we can do, and this is something which is called a photon echo or spin echo for those who are around a little bit longer than me, you can send a pi pulse along the same direction here, which leads to the fact that all these dipoles are flipped around the v-axis by 180 degrees, so they end up on the other side. So that's what we have here. This dipole here will end up here. This one will end up here, and so on. The phase evolution is still the same, so you see that sometime later, while in the beginning we have dephasing, while everything rephases, we build up the original macroscopic coherence again, which gives rise to the emission of a light pulse, which we generally call an echo pulse. So this looks a little bit like storage of light. We send something in here. Well, we do something else. 
and what we sent in, in the beginning comes back out. And you can also show that if this is not just one pi pulse, but something a little bit smaller and maybe two pulses or three, well, then we get also something a little bit smaller out. It's also two pulses or three. So it smells a little bit like a memory, and indeed it is, and has been used extensively back in the 80s in order to store and recall pulses of light in an all optical fashion. Mm -hmm. What is the problem if you want to go with this to quantum state storage? Well, we want to replace the first pi over 2 pulse by one single photon, which basically does nothing to your block vector. It just tilts it a tiny little bit from the ground state, a little bit up. What happens then is after the pi pulse, we have a basically inverted medium. We get rephasing of the initially generated macroscopic coherence, well, it's very small at the time, but we, we regenerate it, and then what happens is that we get amplified emission, but we also get spontaneous emission. If there is an inverted medium, we always have spontaneous emission. So let's drop for the moment just the amplification idea, because it applies both to the actually generated fingerprint of the initially sent in, but also to the spontaneous emission that we get anyway. And just look what the spontaneous emission does. So I think here right now of sending in, well, a quantum state, a single photon which is in the superposition of being generated in an early interval here or a later interval here. So this is a snapshot. If I could do that, I would say, okay, my wave packet is entirely localized in this different, in this small spatial region here, but not here. So if, that's, if I send that into my memory and then I recall it, well, I see that I find this wave function here again, but now it's sitting on a background, which is due to spontaneous emission, and that background is uniformly distributed. So it has nothing to do with time, the moment of time when I actually sent my photon in. So now, clearly, if I detect my photon, well, there is a large probability to detect it where it actually should be sitting in this time interval, but there is also a probability to detect it a little bit later or a little bit earlier. Yeah. And this a little bit later or earlier, which is just due to this admixture of completely uncorrelated photons, lead to the fact that the probability, which is phrased here in terms of fidelity, that I find the output state to be exactly as the input state is bounded by 2 over 3 and not by 1 as it should be. And one can show that this is exactly the number that you can derive based on completely abstract reasoning as being the best fidelity for classical memory. So a memory that doesn't take into account any quantum state storage, a memory that is based on the fact that I do a measurement, I write down the result of my measurement, and then reproduce as good as I can the quantum state that originally was sent in later on. Yeah? That cannot be perfect. We know this Heisenberg's uncertainty relation. I cannot measure all properties of particle at the same time. It turns out that it's simply the spontaneous emission in this kind of proposal or in this kind of approach, which limits this memory to being entirely of classical nature. We cannot use it for quantum state storage. But it has inspired new protocols which can be used for quantum state storage. But before I tell you about those, I tell you a little bit more about the materials that we use. We use rare earth iron doped crystals. And for those who are chemists or who remember the periodic table, well, it's those elements down here which have all these weird names that we never remember. So those have very, very interesting properties, in particular at low temperature. We have transitions in the visible and the telecommunication wavelength, meaning those ions absorb in the visible and the telecommunication <coughs> wavelength. And these are the wavelengths that we want to use in order to send photons or to communicate quantum states using photons. At low temperature, it turns out that the homogeneous line width, so the width of the well, resonance line of each individual atom, becomes very, very narrow. Ranges, well, records are 50 hertz to, let's say, 100 kilohertz or so, which then means that the storage time or the optical coherence time, the T2 time that we have, is up to 4 milliseconds. If you look at ground state coherence, for instance, between hyperfine levels, well, coherence times up to 30 seconds have been demonstrated. So this is very, very promising. It's a very interesting material. We have also a large inhomogeneous broadening, which is to a large extent due to the fact that as I replace ions in my crystalline lattice, this is an artistic picture of a crystalline lattice, if, as I replace small ions by the big rare earth ions, well, they certainly deform the lattice, lattice, the, the, the lattice matrix. And that leads to the fact that we get locally different electric fields acting on these ions, and by doing that we get locally different stark shifts, and altogether this leads to a shift of the resonance frequency and to a large inhomogeneous broadening. So these ions are very interesting due to those properties here, and have been used since the 80s extensively for all optical storage of classical data, and since a few years people work also heavily on storage of quantum data. So the first protocol 
is what we refer to as controlled reversible inhomogeneous broadening. Let's assume we have such an inhomogeneous broadened system, and now let's imagine this is a three-level system, so we have at least one more well, additional state here. Now if we have a laser interacting, let's say, with this subclass of ions here, well, it promotes those ions that can be absorbed, or that can absorb the laser frequency, to the excited state, and we let's, let's assume right now that there is a decay channel down to this auxiliary level, and that the lifetime in this level is very long. So what we do is optical pumping, we remove ions that can interact with this laser at a particular frequency, while we pump them to other states that do not interact anymore with the laser, so we generate what we call a spectral hole. There won't be any absorption left at that particular frequency. Now let's move the laser to a different frequency and do it again. And as we do that, we can generate an absorption spectrum which looks like that. We have an isolated absorption line sitting on an absorption-free background. Now it turns out that some of these ions, or some of these uh, absorbers, depending on the symmetries in the crystal, have permanent electric dipole moments, which means that we get stuck shifts as we apply an electric field. Now, if the dipole moment is different in the ground excited state, while these two states will be shifted by different amounts, which means that we can shift the frequency. If we apply a great, uh, an electric field gradient, then ions sitting in different positions in our crystal will see different frequency shifts. So what we do is that we go from this isolated absorption line to a broadened line. So again, we have an inhomogeneously broadened line, but as opposed to the initial medium here, now it's broadened in a controlled way. It's determined by an electric field that I, from the outside, apply to my crystal. So I certainly have now available well, the possibility to act on dephasing and rephasing properties of my ions because it's at the end, it's the frequency that determines this dephasing based on inhomogeneous broadening. So you may get already an idea about what you have to do. Well, once you have broadened your medium, while well, you send in your light in an arbitrary quantum state, you have to make sure it is completely absorbed. You get fast dephasing, so you have a phase evolution which depends on the detuning of each resonance frequency with respect to the carrier frequency and the time that you wait. Sometime later, reuse the broadening to zero. Before I go on, let's go one step back and let's think about what is quantum memory. Well, what you want in a way is absorb light in atomic medium and then later on time reverse the absorption process. It's, if you can achieve that, that means that your light comes out in exactly the same state, only the trailing and the leading edge are swapped. And it also means that all light comes out. So that's what you want. It also means that light has to come out in backward direction. In order to provoke that, that well, what you do initially as you send in light into your medium, you generate a forward propagating spin wave, or pseudo spin wave. Now that can give rise later on to a forward propagating echo emission, which is not what you want. So you have to do what we call a phase matching operation. You have to make sure that whatever your spin wave is, next, is mapped on a backward propagating wave. So you have to apply a phase shift of 2kz which brings the, the argument of this exponential function here from plus ikz to minus ikz, which tells you at the end light is remitted in the backward direction. And then later on, you have to re-establish the broadening only with reverse sign, so that ions which were initially blue shifted towards the right side here will now shift it towards the red side, and at the end, the global phase evolution, meaning what happened during the first time t here and then during time t prime, uh, where you have different detuning, is such that all ions at some moment in time have experienced exactly the same phase shift, so you have built up the original coherence again without the problem of having an inverted medium, and you can show that this actually allows you unity, efficiency, and fidelity in your recall. This is the first experiment, or this is the first approach. The second one is based on what we call atomic frequency combs. It's something which actually goes back to 1979, where similar ideas have also been used for classical storage, however, without realizing that you can, well, tweak it in a way that allows efficient quantum state storage. So again, we start with the medium as described before. We do the optical pumping, but now we generate many isolated lines. Now, well, after that, we just send in our, our state of light, and if it's absorbed, well, then we get again fast dephasing. However, now, due to the discrete nature of these absorption lines here, we get repetitive establishment of the original coherence, which means that well, after a time which is just inverse time of the frequency spacing here, we get the light back out. So this is also memory, but it's a pre-programmed memory. It depends on the spacing in this frequency comp that I've generated in the first place. However, it turns out you can easily 
change it into a memory whose recall you can determine after storage as you need. And for that, you have to map the optically excited coherence on, this, uh, on the transition that you use in the beginning. You can map it using a pi pulse to coherence between two ground states, or not the state that you used initially for the opti optical pumping. Let's assume there is another state. And it turns out that in these materials, materials, there is no correlation between inhomogeneous broadening on different transition, meaning that the comp structure that you have set up on this transition, which gives rise to the repetitive dephasing, is washed out as you store information on coherence between those levels. So during that time, you can store right now your quantum information or your photon without it being recalled, and when you want it back, well, then you map this coherence between ground states again onto coherence onto, exci onto optical excited states, onto electronic states, and you get the recall as you want it. So you have also the possibility to store quantum information or photons for the time that you want, as long as coherence properties of your medium allow you to do that. So again, well, it turns out you can store information, at least theoretically, with unity efficiency and also fidelity. So what do we use? We use a lithium niobate crystal, which you see here. Ah, there's something missing. Um, which is co-doped, first of all, with thulium. So our collaborators in Paderborn evaporate a small layer of thulium on top, put it in the oven, and I don't know a lot about material science, and that's probably clear here. Uh, they wait two days, and some of the thulium indiffuses into the material, and here is plotted the thulium concentration as a function of distance from the top layer. So you see it occupies well, a layer of four or five microns or so. After that process, well, our collaborators deposit a, a thin strip of titanium on top of the whole thing, put it again in the oven, the titanium also indiffuses and thereby raises the, the, uh, the refractive index in the material, which generates a waveguide. Shown here is the field distribution of the light. So we have a single mode waveguide right now in the area, in the region, where we have also thulium, so we can have interaction between erbium, sorry, between thulium and light. So now why is that interesting? Well, first of all, thulium absorbs at 795 nanometer wavelength. This is a wavelength where air is transparent, which is, of course, nice for us for quantum communication purposes. It is a wavelength where we have very efficient single photon counters, which is also a good thing. And third, it is a wavelength where we can, with ease, generate entangled photon pairs, which is, again, one of the key primitives that we need for quantum communication, as I briefly explained in my very first slide. The homogeneous line width that we measure at around 3 Kelvin at the wavelength that we use is of the order of 200 kilohertz. That could be a little bit better. We would have to cool a little bit further down. Um, we also observe a large polarization and wavelength depending on optical depth. For the polarization where we have minimum optical depth, it is still 2.2 per centimeter well, at the wavelength and temperature that we work with. We cannot measure the optical depth at different polarization because it's simply too thick so that we, well, the measurement is too imprecise. The lifetime in the excited state here um, is 80 microseconds. The lifetime in this state here is 2.4 milliseconds, and what happens as we apply a magnetic field is that all these levels split in nuclear Zeeman levels, and it turns out that the lifetime in the different nuclear Zeeman levels in the ground states here go up to a second at a field of 100 or 200 Gauss. So these are the levels that we can actually use for optical pumping. Um, as I said, the lifetime there has to be long, has to be long compared to the lifetime here so that we can actually do efficient optical pumping. So this shows that thulium is actually an interesting material. Lithium niobate, again, is very interesting. It has no inversion symmetry, which leads to all these nonlinear effects that you use for second thermoid generation and so on. It turns also out in these materials, um, <coughs> we have permanent electric dipole moments for the electronic states that we couple here. So it means we can, as we apply an electric field, we can stark shift the resonance lines. Further on, it's a telecom material meaning that people master very well the waveguide fabrication techniques as described before. People can put electrodes around these waveguides, which then means that first of all we can switch large electric fields very quickly in a sub nanosecond uh, range using while well, closely spaced electrodes with let's say 10 micrometer distance or so. We can achieve large intensities in our media or large electric fields, um, which means we have large radio frequencies, we can do the optical pumping efficiently. And finally, it simplifies integration with fiber optics and also into networks. So what you see here is actually the picture that I had on the first slide. This is the thulium doped crystal that we see here. We have fibers which are aligned, well, just butt coupled against the input and output side 
of our waveguide, you see the waveguide glowing here under red illumination and the fibers are steered with XYZ translation stages um, against the input and output side of the crystal. The whole thing is in a cryostat, which can be cooled down to 3 Kelvin and is actually sitting in a superconducting coil, which you just see here, which allows us to generate or to apply magnetic fields across the sample. The rest of the setup is shown here. There's a laser emitting light at 795.5 nanometer. It's an external cavity laser, not particularly well stabilized, but it's good enough for us. We can use an acousto-optic modulator followed by a polarization modulator and a polarizing beam splitter in order to modulate very short pulses. Here, 500 picoseconds mean while we are down to 200 picoseconds. We send those pulses through optical fibers into our cryostat, through the sample, extract the light again using fibers, and then detect the light and then monitor everything on an oscilloscope. Um, the measurement sequence is as follows. We prepare this atomic frequency grating, sending pulses during 10 or 100 milliseconds into the medium. So what is shown here is just a sequence of pulses as a function of time. If you look at the spectrum of those, well, a comb, if I fully transform it, gives again a comb, which means that right now, well, as a function of frequency, we see something similar. So right now at these frequencies, atoms are removed from the ensemble in the waveguide here. Now, if I balance power broadening, laser jitter, and so on, I can achieve that I generate an atomic frequency grating, which looks like a cosinus grating, with a width um, that is determined by the inverse of each of these pulses. And while well, the distance here is determined by the distance between those excitation pulses here. Once we have done that, but we wait for roughly one millisecond. We have to do that to make sure that any population which is still sitting in the 3H4 excited state here due to optical pumping has decayed down to any other level so that the, the, the light which is generated during this decay doesn't interfere with the light that we actually want to store. And once we have done that, we send in the data that we want to store and we register well, the, the part of the data which is directly transmitted because the optical depth right now is not such that we absorb everything. And then we see later on what is actually recalled by the medium. So what you see here is a first experiment where we use 20 nanosecond long pulses. So you see here, as we chirp the laser frequency across the absorption line, we see this cosinus type grating. You see that it doesn't go all the way down to the bottom, so we certainly have to, still have to improve the optical pumping. You see that the width is limited, while it's limited by the fact that the pump pulses are 20 nanosecond long, and you see that's the cosine grating as you want. So from this, we can calculate what is the recall efficiency that we expect. It depends on what we call the effective reversible absorption. So this is the optical depth in this part here, scaled down by the finesse of the comp, which gives us something like the duty ratio, the duty cycle, or the filling ratio of the absorption here. So you see um, this part here includes the factors D1 over F. There's another part, which is just the irreversible absorption in the remaining background that we have here, which has nothing to do with, uh, with record of light. And there's a fact here, a factor here, which refers to the width of each individual peak, and which tells us something about the homogeneous broadening, the broadening that we cannot undo, uh, or dephasing we cannot undo based on this particular approach. So altogether, if we put this together, we find an efficiency of 1.6%. As we do the experiment, what you see here is the light which is directly leaked out of the sample, which is not absorbed in the first place. And you see that we then, 20, 100 nanoseconds later, will have a recall or a fingerprint of we sent out here with small efficiency. So the internal efficiency that we measure experimentally is 1.25%, not 1.6, but it's reasonably close. And I point out these measurements are also, well, haven't been done a long time ago, and we haven't really tried to push those to the limit. So this is nice, but what we would like is store much shorter pulses. So the next experiment, we have replaced the 20 nanosecond excitation pulses by 500 picosecond long pulses. So here you see a screenshot from the pulses that we generate. And then if you want to probe the grating, well, it turns out that this is very tricky since we cannot scan our laser over a couple of gigahertz bandwidth. We can scan it over 500 megahertz, which you see here. The scan is not a linear scan. We apply a sinus voltage to our laser current and thereby we change the frequency. So you see that we see the grating with a period which uh, is larger at the moment where the scan rate is at large, as expected. You also see that the amplitude of the grating changes over time here. This is simply due to timing resolution problems of our detector that we use, but you also clearly see that we have a uniform grating over at least 500 megasec uh, megahertz more, we cannot say. Now, as we send the light, while well, we see 
the directly transmitted parts here. And then we see a little bit later that we have indeed light being recalled at the various possible recall times. So this is the first echo that should appear. This is the second one. That is the third one. And as we measure the width here, well, we see that while well, the pulse has spread a little bit from 500 picoseconds to 550 picoseconds, just based on the fact that our grating is not infinitely wide, but it is so far the shortest pulse that has been stored in a quantum memory approach, in an approach which allows also storage of single photons in quantum states, which we haven't done here yet. This is all classical. These are strong pulses. Since we can store short pulses, and we can store them for 100 nanoseconds, or also 200 nanoseconds, well, we can see how many pulses can we actually pack into the storage time. So what you see here is, again, just a quick measurement of sending 100 pulses, all of one nanosecond duration, into the memory, and then 200 nanoseconds later, we see how they come back out of the memory. So what we can show here is that we can indeed demonstrate that we can indeed store a hundred different optical modes simultaneously in the memory and then get a fingerprint out of the readout. So, so far, well, we have just shown what would be a classical storage. Two more things have to be done. First of all, we have to show that the storage itself um, conserves coherence. So if I send in two coherent pulses, what comes back out, well, the they should still be coherent. And the next thing would also be then to go from classical pulses containing many, many photons to single photons or higher level single photons. So the next thing here is about the storage of coherent pulses. Before I do that, I go back to something which is purely optical, which is a little bit easier to understand. How much time do we have left? We've got about three minutes. Three minutes. Okay, so I will speak very, very quickly and write very small. <laughs> okay, so imagine you have a pulse of light or a single photon, which I sent into a Marzena type interferometer. Here it's a fiber optical representation where this photon can either go over through the short arm or through the long arm, so it would actually emerge from that interferometer in the superposition of having gone through both, um, and that is what we call a so-called timing qubit. So Sam, I bring you back to your original uh, homework. So this is a similar thing for optics. Here it works. So here we get a photon out in superposition of two different times, or we can also think of that if it's many photons, well, it's two optical pulses which have a stable phase relation, which is just given by the path length difference in this interferometer. If we send that into another interferometer, well, what will happen is that those, this photon can either go through the short arm, come out like that, or go through the long arm, come out a little bit later. So if you look in the central time interval here, well, we see interference between the first pulse here, which was delayed, and the second pulse here, which went short. So as we change the phase in any of the interferometer, we see interference in the central peak, meaning the intensity should vary. Now, if we look at our storage memory, well, the comp spacing in the, in the comp that the spacing of the comp that I generated in the first place determines the moment of recall. So let's say this is my double data pulse that I sent in, currently classical. Dep depending on the comp spacing, it will come out like that. If I change the comp spacing, it will come out a little bit later. Now, if I generate my material, my material in the beginning as being in the superposition of two different comps, so what comes then out is that this one is exactly as here, kind of duplicated and replaced. So I have again two wave packets overlapping in the central time window. So as I change the phase, either of the data, or I slightly change the, part, the, the difference of the comps, I should see interference as before. These are the measurements. What you see here is well, the input state that we want to store. What you see here is for well, two of the three pulses that we expect to come out, and you see close or very, very close to perfect interference in the central window as we expected. As we change the phase in the grating, we see that right now we have very well, very good constructive interference in the central window. As we change the phase continuously, well, you see this cosinus type function that you all expect. This is origin, so the zero is always displayed, <laughs> displaced from the bottom. And the visibility that we have so far is 99, well, very, very close to 1. Okay, so in conclusion, what I've shown you is storage of light, so far all classical, in, a memory, in an approach to storage which allows you storage of single photons in quantum states. We've done that in the Thulium lithium niobate waveguide, which is promising for integration. I've demonstrated you broadband storage of light that's actually shorter than anything that has been shown so far. I've shown you storage of multiple modes. I've shown you coherent storage. The internal storage efficiency in the later experiments is of the order of 5%. 
the fiber to fiber coupling loss here at the moment is at the, at the moment 10 dB, so we lose a factor of 90% of all light, which is not great, but I'm pretty sure that can be done better if we take into account or if we look at mode matching between the optical mode, which is supported in the crystal, in the waveguide here, and whatever comes out of those fibers. So next steps, while well, we want to go down from storing classical strong pulses of light, we want to go down to storage of time and qubits, while well, single photons in superposition states. We also want to store single photons on demand, so this is actually what we are working on right now. I expect results today or tomorrow. And we want to also store entangled timing qubits. The beauty of that source is the broadbandness makes it directly interfaceable with photon pair sources, which generally have bandwidths which are much, much larger than those that are achievable or have been achieved so far in other approaches to storage. And at the end, we want to explore the unique possibilities of rapid electric field switching as we can do if we add electrodes to those waveguides. And we actually have a sample already in Paderborn where electrodes are directly deposited on the crystal with a distance with a spacing of a few micrometers. So with this, well, I thank the people who were involved in this experiment, Cecilia Lameda, and Sangla Murek, and Neil Sinclair. Well, I thank Wolfgang Zola for the collaboration. I thank you for your attention, and I thank those who made this possible. Does anyone would like? Yes, Harold. Uh, at some point you showed the uh, kind of interferometry in time, right, with the two pulses and back to back. Now, the, the one that picture was interfering, the side peaks seem to be affected too. Is that yes. Supposed to happen? It's not supposed to happen. And I have to admit, this, this data was taken yesterday. <laughs> 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 so, what I see for now is, well, yes, indeed, as you said, this is twice as large as those, and there shouldn't be. I'm not sure what that is due. Um, ask me in a week again. There's even a little, even an additional peak on the side. It looks even like there's a little bit here. Yeah. So this could be something due to uh, inhomogeneity in the gratings that we generate. So at the end, you can think of it like a diffraction grating, only act, it acts in time and not in space. And if it's not exactly cosinus type grating, which you easily get here, you probably get all kinds of different things. But as I said, for the moment, these are really almost raw data. This has to be looked at a little bit more carefully. Yeah, maybe a little bit. So that, yeah. Uh, at some point, I had a, had a storage of light in a machine in, in warm gases, right? And. Uh, uh, I was wondering, does this method that you're using in dope crystals, does it also work in warm gases? So the, the atomic what is it, frequency cone? Yes. So that's the first part. And the other thing is, I, I, I'm fascinated by that, that term, atomic frequency cone, right? It, it's reminiscent of a, a laser frequency cone, I think, which is a big deal. And, and, and things such as frequency slippage is, of course, uh, it makes it, you know, controlling that makes it a useful tool. How far is that analogy pushed? So there are two questions, sir. Okay, the first question, yes, you can apply these protocols to gases. And the first protocol, this, this controlled reversible inhomogeneous broadening, is a little bit simpler in gases because you get a change of the detuning of each ion as you look from the other side. So you don't have to actively modify the transition frequencies of each ion by applying field gradients, by applying electric fields. You can simply trigger recall in backward emission, in backward direction, and then those ions which were initially blue shifted will emit red shift and you get it almost for free. So you can do that. It has been done recently in one of the Australian groups, in Pinko Lamb's group in, uh, in Canberra. And uh, atomic frequency comps you could certainly do as well, only it hasn't been demonstrated so far. They work just with the other proposal. The analogy between the atomic frequency comes and well, the frequency comes. Yes, I, I don't. I don't know how far you can uh, how far you can push that, uh, but there are probably things to be learned at the end. Oh, you can also think of a model of laser, which is also a similar thing. Yeah. Well, let's thank the speaker again and. Uh, <laughs>